appreciate you joining today's discussion focused on the cybersecurity challenges and IR in the cloud. My name is Sean Bertrand. I'm the Senior Vice President of Security Programs Team at CBI. I've been there for 19 years, real passionate about cybersecurity. All right, it is my true honor to introduce uh, our colleagues and co-presenters here today, Andrew Crawl and Matthew Waddell. Andrew, Matthew, could you please give yourselves an introduction? Sure, I'll go first here. Um, I'm a senior security or application security consultant here at CBI. I've uh, been with CBI for just over four years now. Uh, started my career as a web developer in uh, the late 90s. Uh, had several GX certifications, including a uh, certified web app pen tester. Um, last year, I received my offensive security web expert certification as well. Um, and that is my 10 second intro. I'll pass it over to you, Matthew. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Matthew Waddell. I've been in uh, cybersecurity, IT security for about 20 years now. Um, I, my principal focus is on forensics and incident response. I'm the director here at CBI under Sean. Um, I love what I do. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Andrew. And transitioning to our agenda, a lot of words on the slides here. What are we going to talk about? Um, for me, it really comes down to three things that we're going to discuss today. All right. Number one, what are the threats and the vulnerabilities you need to be aware of related to the cloud with supporting data and stats and metrics? I am a very data-driven individual. I feel everybody should look at data and make conscious decisions based on what that data is telling us. We'll cover that. Number two, what are these attacks and what does the impact and result mean? We hear so often when we talk about something like, you know, some cloud security, API authorization, misconfiguration. First of all, what does that mean? And what is the result? What's the outcome? What do we need to worry about and, and be prepared about? Andrew is going to talk us through some of that today with some real world examples. Number three, when issues like this are exploited, and they turn into incidents. How can we prepare and manage cloud-based incident response? What are the things, the, the very unique elements that are required of an incident response program as it pertains to the cloud? Matthew Waddell is going to leverage his IR experience and cloud applicability to walk us through some of these items. So we're gonna take a journey together in talking about what are the threats, what are this, what's a typical impact result, and how can I prepare myself for incident response in the cloud? We're gonna start with the poll question. And that poll question is, I love poll questions. If I'm being honest, it keeps us on our toes a little bit and uh, sometimes they're fun to fill out. So does your organization plan to be mostly or all in the cloud in the next two years? All right, so, you know, I think sometimes it's hard to find companies now that don't have any cloud presence, but you know, some examples that we see are like law firms and research and development groups or government related ent entities where never going to happen may be an applicable answer. If I was a betting man, which I'm not really, I'd say that we're likely going to see kind of mostly or all in is our top answer, but let's take a look at the results. Mostly, all right, 75% of us are not purely all in, but we are very vested in, in the cloud, obviously applicable to the group that we're talking about here today. All right, let's transition to some stats. All right, let's talk about accelerated migration, which you all are on the front lines of understanding that we were already on a fast track to this, this accelerated cloud migration and COVID was just a huge catalyst to fueling that in, in, a, in a very accelerated way, right? Um, the challenge, however, is that the acceleration of digital adoption is also fueled growing threats and the need for more effective IR. I'm telling you, we've seen it firsthand as companies making this really dramatic approach to put things in the cloud without thinking about some of the fundamentals. And then when something happens, it's, it's generally too late. So there's no doubt we can look at some of these stats here and understand that this, the momentum's there, right? By 2025, 95% of workloads will live in the cloud, right? So there's no doubt the data tells us that we're moving full steam ahead into the cloud. And the challenge is that we need to begin to integrate security into the fabric of not only the migration, Migration, the architecture, the design, all sorts of different things. And I'm not telling you things that you don't already know. I get that, but we're setting the stage for more realistic, actionable data that comes out of this. So all the data for us is telling us, 
yeah, there's a problem and we got to start focusing on it. The next slide reiterates this a bit when we talk about the expected decline on on-premise workloads. You know, these are anticipated projections by 2025. No surprise here, you know, as we look across public, private, and hybrid offerings, we will see a noticeable decrease of on-prem workloads supported by the stats and the data that we are seeing. All right. Next slide. I like this slide. I think I like this slide. Let me tell you what. I, so this is a quote from Gardner's May 2020 report about the five things you must absolutely get right for secure infrastructure and platform as a service uh, solutions. I feel like I looked at this first and I'm like, this is a mean quote, isn't it? It's, it's directly aimed to you and I. We are all customers of the cloud. It's not mean, it's reality, right? Moving forward, we're going to talk about what can be done to keep us kind of in that 1%, whether you want to be in that 1% or you, you want to be in this 1%, all right? And uh, I think this, this quote in of itself speaks volumes. So when we talk about cloud failures as a result of customer behavior. The first thing I think that is really important is talking about our responsibility versus the CSP, right? And I'm sure you've all seen this as well, right? But this graphic really provides a nice illustrative example or narrative on how the responsibility shifts between the customer and the CSPs. You know, we have various different roles and responsibilities. And I think the emphasis for me is, is quite simple you as a customer are responsible for your data. You are responsible for application, operating system, fundamental security, right? And guess what? Unfortunately, these, these responsibilities are the threats and the risks that the malicious adversaries are taking advantage of. So, you know, the CSP is really only responsible for that underlining foundation, i.e. The, the, the software and the hardware. So having this understanding uh, is really important just as a stepping stone into in, in realizing where you need to focus your efforts and address the disparity that we see with customers running various different CSP in various different regions with various different compliance mandates. You may have a little bit of a hybrid focus here as you look at a typical RACI associated with the shared responsibility model. Okay, another poll question. What do you think are the top application security threats and vulnerabilities when it comes to the cloud? Are we talking misconfiguration, authorization issues, APIs? Because what we're talking about in, in many cases as we work to get people to fill this thing out is that the cloud, you know, one of the primary interfaces for the cloud is an application. It's a mobile application. It's an interface of some sort to all this technology that you have in the cloud. And we need to make sure that we're focused on that as it's the primary attack vector that's leveraged in a lot of cases. So let's see what the answers come across here. Misconfiguration. Well, great answer. I feel the same way. We're going to see a little blend of uh, a lot of these things moving forward with this presentation. All right. So as a good segue, no surprise, right? Well-positioned poll, by the way, to the moderators. Thank you. Um, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about misconfigurations and authorization issues and, and all of these things that are up here on the screen. And we're going to do one of the best rock stars that I know who has exploited these things. It's, and we've got a very cloud-centric focus with this discussion. Andrew Kroll. And I mean it when I say rock star, Jedi Knight, he's one of the best that I've ever seen in this space. So again, Andrew, I will expect to check in the mail at some point, but why don't you take it over and walk us through a little uh, on these items? Sure. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I would have said D, all of the above, really. There's so many different things that you could pick from that list there. So I don't think any of those are really wrong, but uh, so let's look at, so some of the things we're going to be talking about here is authorization issues and secure APIs, outdated libraries and misconfigurations. But I'm going to start off with authorization issues here. What is it? Uh, mainly I'm talking about parameter tampering, forced browsing, no authorization at all, which I see way too often. Uh, the first screenshot I got here in the foreground is, is going to be a classic parameter tampering you know, ID equals 3406 when you try to get to, you know, you click on my profile and you see in the URL ID equals 3406. That's just, a, I don't know, every time I see that type of thing in a web application, I'm going to click 3405, 3403. I'm going to keep decrementing it down, incrementing it, seeing when I get there. Um, 
this is how programs used to always be developed. It's, it's easy, um, that incremental, it's easy to implement. It's easy to troubleshoot. You have one ID number. Nowadays, what a lot of programmers are doing, they're implementing a GUID in there, which is just a random long string of, of letters and numbers there that I'm not going to guess. So if you give me an ID equals 3G, U, V, dash, whatever, I'm not going to be able to guess the next one in line there. So it's a little bit more secure, but if you don't have authorization in place, I, I can still exploit that. Um, so this one right here, ID equals 3406. And you see on the left on there, I have all those payloads there, which is a bunch of numbers. That's me just trying to scroll through all the ID numbers I possibly can. And then you see in those columns there, I'm grepping out, pulling out some data out of there. Um, I see my email address, first name, last name, username. So I'm pulling back all this information about these other customers in the system. That's just a treasure trove of information for me as an attacker. Um, I could use that for a, I could use that for a great social engineering campaign. If I have your first name, last name, username, email, I could send you an email or a phishing email that's very customized to you. Um, if you have a cross-site scripting or some other vulnerability on another website, I could actually use your website against you and attack again from there. So these authorization issues always put authorization checks on. Um, every parameter just to make sure they have access to what they're requesting in there. Um, trusting your users to actually follow when you click my profile ID equals 3406 is not a good idea. Um, you're not going to get the users that are going to sit there and follow the rules. Uh, the other one we got in the background is, is pretty similar. It's kind of like a parameter tampering, but it also there's no authorization at all on this. I was testing out a web application where they had, um, it was in your profile. You had some documents stored in there. This one's a mortgage interest statement. Um, it was stored in an S3 bucket. So it was a separate part of the whole application, different URL, but you click on it and this loads up here. It, I kind of ghosted out the URL there. It's, it's, there's some randomization in there, um, but if, if you knew the first part of it, you can get to the other part where you have, you know, where I have highlighted there, 00057682. That's the same thing. I'm going to increment, I'm going to decrement, and I did, um, and I got the other user's interest statements of, of along with a lot of other stuff as well. And those mortgage interest statements have some sensitive information on them. I have my uh, user's name in there, their address, uh, social security numbers as well. Um, and when I did this, I thought that was a great find that you know there, I could actually get to this and decrement, increment and get to this other user's data. Um, but I went one step further and I actually pulled out the session cookie and replayed it again. And I was able to pull up the data as well. So they tried to say, think that, since this was stored in the cloud somewhere, I don't need the authorization checks because they're going to access it through a link on my application. And that's just not, that's not a good security mechanism there. Um, so if one user can get this link, um, they can actually use that to get other users' data. And if you notice the bigger problem here or added problem is that this is a get request. Get requests are stored in the browser. If you've ever done that, pull down your browsing history, you have those get requests stored in there. Get requests are stored in other areas too, log files, um, other kind of log files. And you know, if you're in a public place, people can intercept that and see that. Um, so this type of situation, if they had some kind of session cookie in place or some kind of authorization in place, um, it would protect this user's data way more uh, than what we see here. So moral of the story on this one is never trust your end users uh, to, to play nicely with your application and always put some authorization checks in there. Um, I remember, on. yeah, Go I ahead. remember Andrew when maybe a few years ago when like pizza tracking systems or, you know, something restaurant delivery, right in the URL, they'd have something like order ID is equal to one, two, three, four. And then, hey, I click one, two, three, three. Oh, there's somebody else's order detail. Panera Bread had a big vulnerability on this. So as instrumental as it's or as trivial as it sounds, sometimes developers just don't think about this stuff. Feel free to proceed. Sorry, I just wanted to interject that. No, thank you. You let me get a drink of my coffee here. I'm getting a dry throat. <laughs> yeah, that's that's perfect too, because yeah, if you ever see that, I know everyone's gonna start doing this now, but let them know if you if you see an experience like that because your data is in there as well. So uh, so insecure APIs. Uh, that's the next thing I want to talk about here. It's it, there's some similar things to the authorization issues I'm here seeing here. So missing or misconfigured authorization checks, kind of like I was talking about in the last slide. The top right here, you can see I'm requesting a PDF document um, out of a bucket here, and there's no session token in here. There's no um, authorization token in here. Nothing, and I could pull up this document here. So 
So that's a missing authorization check. And in the bottom left, we can see some misconfigured authorization checks. Uh, JWTs are great. A lot of programmers like to use those. You sign into application, you can use that JWT to access your, uh, your cloud resources, your APIs. Um, they're awesome. I, I love using them as well. Um, they're random. Um, they're not easy to guess. The problem is, is that you actually have to put program to delete these on sign out um, or to you know, destroy them on sign out. And a lot of programmers don't do that. Uh, so when you do this, I would recommend always, as you can see here in the bottom left, you see issued at May 26, 2021, but then you have expired at May 26, 2022. That's a long time. Uh, you never want to have a session token open that long, especially if you don't destroy it um, when a user signs out, because uh, that's available for the, anybody to use or anybody to guess or, or whatever you want to say to get to resources, um, especially in this example here where we see user admin role administrator. And yes, I did see this. Um, so you definitely want to make these expire as, as soon as you can. I mean, it's all about your business experience um, and your, your user experience that you have there. I don't want a token myself to last longer than a day. Any user that's in a system longer than a day can resign back in. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all if they complain. Uh, then we got test functionality, internal only functionality, exposed, exposed configuration, definition files. Um, I, I, every time I test out like a mobile application or web application, I ask for API documentation. Uh, just so I, if you're browsing the application, there's a possibility you may not hit all the functionality. So I always ask for some API documentation just so I make sure I'm hitting every API endpoint that's exposed to the internet just so that they're getting everything tested. Um, in this situation in the bottom right here, this was an API configuration that was exposed externally. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with exposing that externally. Um, that's, that's not a problem at all. Sometimes you even have to expose stuff like that externally. But you got to make sure that what you're exposing externally is secured and it's something that you want to have sh shared out for users to see. Um, me personally, I wouldn't share it out. If I did share it out, I'd only share out something that's non-authenticated that people can get to. Um, but this one I was actually able to pull up when I was testing the application. I did see get user by username. I saw login. I saw logout. Uh, I saw is username valid when I try to create an account. Um, reset password. Yeah, I saw all of those. What I didn't see when I was testing the application out was test get all users, test hello world. Those ones, when I came upon that, I'm like, no way. So what my assumption was here was that test hello world, we're all guilty of that, right? We do that just to make sure we got a good connection, things are working. And I, my guess is the programmer in the next phase was like, let's do test get all users. Let's make sure I'm making a connection to that database. Everything's good, you know, that type of thing. But he never removed that API call out of there. Um, they didn't give me this API documentation. I found it. Anyone can find it. And it does work. I can do test get all users and I got all users then. Going back to that authorization error uh, in the previous slide, now I have a lot of information I can use. I can use this for well, what I call the triple threat, which is no, no uh, user enumeration, no account lockout, and weak password policy. I could use that to just try to brute force some user accounts there and more than often, more than I would like to see, I'm able to actually get some accounts there. So um, exposing these type of files, like I said, is not a problem. Just make sure you know what you're exposing and it has the right checks in place. I see a lot of APIs that are exposed externally and they rely on, well, you know, I, I hear, how'd you find that SQL injection in there? We have some client side controls that are preventing you from inputting this type of bad data in there. And they're just not understanding that as a user, or as an attacker, I'm not relying on those client side controls. I'm disabling those or I'm going directly at that API. Um, so never rely on those client side controls. I'm going right at that API. And that actually goes into my next point, lack of input validation or security and controls in place. Um, the security controls in place. So let's say I want to do that user enumeration. I get is username valid. I'm going to hit that over and over and over again, just like I did in that previous slide to try to find some valid usernames there. On the, on the user side in the GUI, they're going to have some kind of CAPTCHA or something in place there to slow me down. But if you hit this, direct, this API directly, I can just keep iterating through that all day if I want to and, and enumerate some users. So just because it's not something that a user sees as API in the background, um, put some controls in place, put some throttling in place, rate limiting in place, input validation in place. It's not hidden. It's being seen. Just 
just not by some users. Some users don't know it's there. Um, so that's my insecure APIs. Let's move on to the next one here, the use of vulnerable third-party libraries. This one I see all the time. Every single application has an out outdated library just because they're, so libraries like jQuery and things like that, why reinvent the wheel, wheel right? Um, they have so much functionality built into them, so much good use built into them. I would definitely recommend using another library to import some functionality and some security controls and things like that in there. But people are always testing them. People are always trying to find new vulnerabilities and they're always finding new vulnerabilities. So always make sure you're updating them. My recommendation is go through your applications, find every third party library you're using, document it and always track for new vulnerabilities in that or at least once a year, update that library. And here's a great example for it. This is actually a real world example when we were testing for a customer. This was um, two years in a row we tested for them. The first year we found this Teller library vulnerability where we could upload a file um, to their system. That's not good, right? Definitely not good, um, but we couldn't do anything with it. We could just upload a file. Um, we had a lot of other findings in there and I think they prioritized those ones. The next year came around, we had another assessment come through and now there's a new vulnerability that was found. Now it was a deserialization vulnerability. So not only could we upload a random file, um, but we could actually then execute that file. Um, so now we're talking big problem here. If they would have updated earlier, it would have been, saved them a lot of trouble here. So we exploited this one here. There's a proof of concept out on the internet. Um, in the bottom left here, you see this DLL. This is what we uploaded. We compiled and uploaded a sleep command. Uh, this one sleeps for 10 seconds, and you can see in the response time, 10.62 seconds, the application took to come back. Uh, just to make sure, we did 15 seconds, we did 20 seconds. It was all pretty similar, you know, 15, 20 second response time. So we knew it was vulnerable. Next thing we did, we uploaded a remote shell, uh, and this was unauthenticated. This is scary. So we have, on the bottom right, we have an unauthenticated shell on the system as default app pool. Well, that's good. They're not using a service account with a lot of rights or something like that, that we can pivot from there. Unfortunately, this system had a vulnerability where we could escape default app pool and we became system privileged at that point. And we could do a lot more. Um, the easiest thing we could have done, even if we had default app pool, we could have defaced the website. We could have put some malicious code in there. We could have done something uh, to, to gain further access, attack their end users, something like that. Uh, but we tried to go, you know, left, right. We tried to sniff some traffic. We were getting nothing. Um, and the reason was this was actually in the cloud and they were doing the right things. Um, in the cloud, they actually what they did was they prevented left, right traffic, east, west. Um, so we couldn't do anything from there. So they had a good thumbs up on that one. Um, but like I said, still scary. We still could do a lot of damage here, but we, could, we didn't do as much as we could have done. Um, if they didn't have that east, west traffic in there, we could have went a lot further. So the next one we got here is misconfigurations. What is misconfigurations? In my mind, it's not setting least privileged permissions on objects and users, not restricting inbound, outbound access. We just talked about that. Uh, failure to scan user uploaded data. Well, the first one we have here is an S3 bucket. And I see this a lot um, where people actually, they actually have this in here and they allow directory listing in at root of an S3 bucket. And it, you can see here, there's, if you look at the contents, .pdf, uh, .png, there's a lot of stuff in here. You can see max keys is 1000 truncated true. So there's more stuff in here. And it, if you look, if you, what you can't tell, and I think it's the PNG, no, the one above that. They, they do have some good security in place as far as, it's kind of obscure URLs, obscure names. Not, not, not many people are gonna guess these, but if you put a directory listing enabled on this, now everybody can see it because it's any authenticated user can access this. Um, so I, I see this a lot of times where people put some, uh, have their website and it's, it's a, uh, you know, corporate website and they have their company logo or things like that. You know, the professional guy in their suit and tie in the front picture, they'll put this up on the bucket. It's an easy storage location. They'll reference, reference it from their website. Um, but they'll not only do that, but they'll reference those things. Like I saw and said in the first slide, the mortgage interest statement, They'll reference those from the same bucket. And now I can see a listing of everything in that bucket, not only that corporate logo, but I can see all those PDFs of this interest statements. 
Um, in the top right, they have the, the APIs there. I can iterate through and see what their bucket name is and all the objects in the bucket. There's 5,016 items in this bucket. So 1,000 seemed bad, but now we got 5,016 we can go to. I've seen some things in there such as um, architecture diagrams of their cloud environment, um, database usernames and passwords, uh, things that are put up into this cloud environment may have been approved at one point, such as those corporate logos, but you never know what some developer or somebody else may use it as a sharing point for other documentation, um, and they don't know it's exposed externally. So even though it may be something that's approved up there, I would still remove this directory listing. Do not make it available because you never know what's going to go up there in the future, and you may forget that it's exposed externally and listed externally for people to get to. Um, and not restricting inbound outbound access um, on the right here, bottom right, NMAP scan report as testing an application out. I don't know why I decided to just run a quick NMAP on it, uh, but then I see all of these ports open. Um, and I, I, I think back to my developer days where it's, you know, you're on a deadline and they're telling you just make it work. And how do you make it work? You put any, any rules in, you open everything up, you try to, you know, you, just do whatever you can to make things easy so you can make it work. So rules like this here, um, and actually what was on port 8443 was actually uh, an admin um, login page. It wasn't supposed to be exposed externally, but the fact they opened everything up, uh, opened up that as well, which we could start attacking. And then you see some fun stuff there, like a remote desktop 3389 there, just not good stuff to have exposed externally. Any, any rules or open inbound rules, be very careful when you do that type of stuff, the inbound, outbound, east, west, these uh, clouds now, they environments, they allow you to restrict west, east, west traffic, which is very, very good to have. Um, it, it could be a pain to implement, especially when you're talking to other systems, but it does prevent, like we, we saw in that last slide here, it prevented us from going further into another side and hitting another system. And I also see with these any rules like this too, trying to make something work. I don't want to do the paperwork. I don't want to get another VPC spun up. So I'm just going to use a production one that's already out there. Oh, oops, now I just opened up production to another vulnerability because I'm trying to test something on the side here. So make sure you, you segment everything out the best you can. And the other one here I have is failure to scan user uploaded data. I'm going to take a drink of coffee because that's a long story. This one's a big one. This one's a big one, right? <laughs> So a lot of users or a lot of people, they allow users to upload data. And I don't know why. I, I and Whenever I can, I say, do never upload data. Um, if you can, give them a form to fill out. If you have to upload some data, restrict it down to where you can have the specific content type. And there's some libraries out there to help you to make sure that what they're uploading is what you're expecting. Never save it to disk before you scan it. Um, what I always do when I see those, I upload load a bunch of crap to it. I know they hate me when I do that, all that stuff up there, but I, I want to make sure I'm testing everything. And I upload some stuff with some known virus signatures in it just to see if it's caught. Um, and I, I was testing this one out and I uploaded it. And uh, not only could I upload it, but I could re-download a known virus signature. So I know it wasn't checking for viruses and that's, that's fine. Wrote that down. One of the other things I uploaded was a document with, um, if you guys know Burp Suite, uh, Burp Collaborator is an external link to out in the internet that just sits here and waits for connections. And I created a Burp Collaborator um, entry in a document that if somebody opened it, it would make an outbound call to that Burp Collaborator site. Not malicious whatsoever, but it it, known, it knows it happens. And I think I was like two days into the assessment and I pulled up, pulled up my Burp Collaborator and noticed I had an interaction with it, a DNS interaction. So people think when you push stuff up to the cloud is not my environment. I have no, I don't have to worry about it. Whatever's up there's up there. I mean, they scan that stuff, right? No, they don't scan that stuff. And you know what? When you upload stuff to the, the cloud like that, what are you doing with it? You want it for something, right? So it's gonna be interacted with with your end users at some point. It's gonna be used to another web application. They're gonna pull it down locally. Make sure you scan that stuff to make sure it's clean before you pull it in. So, to wrap things up for me, uh, my summary is program and design defensively. Um, don't trust your end users um, to behave and definitely do not trust unauthenticated users. And with that, I think we have another poll question. 
Yeah, we do. And Andrew, first of all, thank you. Great info and, and great recommendations. Um, Andrew's good at keeping people up at night as if you guys couldn't tell, but then inevitably he's great at letting people sleep comfortably as a result of exposing stuff like this and fixing it. This is the kind of, you know, these are the TTPs that we're seeing compromise cloud environments. So how concerned are you about the impact of misconfigurations on cloud security? Kind of a loaded question here, but we'll see, right? Let's see what the answers are here. As soon as we give it a few more seconds. All right, let's see what those results are. Thank you, everybody. You should be very concerned, 91%. And somewhat concerned, yeah, that's good. Not at all. And CSP, was glad we saw 0% there. That is what we were expecting. But yeah, all in all, glad. great stuff, Andrew, great stuff. All right, let's shift gears now. We talk about the impact. Well, the impact is real, all right? 4.4 million average cost of a breach from cloud misconfiguration, 5 trillion over the past two years with many attacks occurring and increasing. Um, I think it's important when you look at these two, in addition to these stats, the, the DBIR found, the Verizon DBIR found that more than 40% of all error-related breaches involved misconfigurations, right? Uh, the Capital One breach, even though it was back in 2019, same thing as Andrew highlighted an AWS S3 bucket vulnerability that they're now facing roughly eight, I think it's 80 last I heard to 120 million in fines alone. Not only what it cost them for the, the incident response, the remediation and all that. So it's compelling data again, and it drives us towards understanding what this impact is when we talk about misconfigurations. Now, Moving forward to preventing misconfigurations, Andrew talked a lot about things in there. We can move to the next slide here. All right. First of all, does everybody know Ron Papil? You probably don't. He's infamous for an infomercial on TV. His Ron Papil set it and forget it, right? You plug it. Don't do that. Uh, we see too many development and operations team, as an example, create like a new cloud server or an app server, and then they configure it so it works, and then they never recheck the configuration. You know, that common security admin nightmare is the potential misconfiguration of these assets is because someone set it and forget it. So we need to know not only where their cloud assets are, organizations need to know, uh, and where the services are, but also the status of those services. Number two, we see one of the most common issues is just not propagating known good security configurations uh, and good security settings into the baseline, right? Everybody has a baseline so that future instances of an app or a piece of cloud infrastructure can benefit from those lessons of the past. That misconfigured basing issue ends up causing problems from the start. So turning that security practices and those lessons learned into previous application iterations into policy and templates is very important. Number three, you know, Agile development methodologies and frameworks like, you know, we hear it all the time, DevSecOps, right? They do use extensive automation to help developers create secure code and, and deploy that code. Yet some companies don't go far enough. You know, they're all running applications and infrastructure that should be regularly checked for security and, and compliance. And automation can help. We just under, we need to understand the benefits of automation and the disadvantages. And we need to understand the benefits of manual testing in regards to some of the disadvantages. We'll highlight some of that here. Number four, use the tools available to your disposal. All right, we'll talk a little bit as we segue into IR that, uh, you know, understand your shared responsibility model and understand what capabilities you have to you. As an example, when I talk to customers about this one thing, oh, this sounds so lame. It sounds like some ad I'm seeing, right? If you do this one thing, no. Many people I talk to aren't familiar with O365s, which is a SaaS solution. They're AIR, they're automated incident response. We'll talk through that, but it's just another tool that they have that many people aren't aware of. And it's beneficial to know that these tools can provide some level, like, rate, like I think a good example is the rate limiting and the throttling. If only this one simple trick, but for real, rate limiting and throttling, great mechanism to preventing these malicious attacks. The volume of these attacks certainly makes a difference. So use those provider tools. And lastly, 
test continuously. If there's any lesson that we learned, what was the DBIR? 84% of these attacks were human oriented, hands on keyboard. Um, what that means is we need to be doing the same thing, right? We need to test continually, leverage the integration of dynamic and static testing into our SDLC and leveraging manual test as well to help fill that gap. But post deployment testing or in the you know you know in that UAT, you know, test dev perspective, testing is critical there as is regular testing of cloud services by human beings. We're not at a point yet where AI has answered all of our our problems and challenges. So, with that in mind, uh, we talked about the threats what it looks like when we capitalize on these threats. But what happens? What do we need to do to prepare for and manage incidents? I'm going to hand it over now to our other rock star, Matthew Waddell, to talk us through this journey. Matthew, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, Sean. Let me start with the absolute worst way to gain your incident response experience is through actually having an incident. This is operating under a reactionary mindset working to solve an event as it occurs and unfolds before your organization. It's reacting without the necessary strategies, tools, relationships, and communication that you should put in place to effectively handle a critical situation that is prone to getting worse before it gets better. It is critical that you reevaluate your incident response plan, how your team is reacting to security incidents. You should be forward thinking and not reactionary thinking as you, in your approach to intrusions. Having a paper that simply lists the contact information is not enough. I mean, while you need that basic information as to who your IT security team is, who, who the cloud providers are, your team should practice, 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 so that when an incident occurs, they're ready, and the incident becomes more of a hiccup and less of a full-blown heart attack. Last year's Poneman Research Institute took a poll of over 5,000 companies looking into the actual cost of a data breach. And the poll showed that the teams that regularly practice their IR plan with their security team, with their HR team, with their legal team, with their corporate liaisons, were able to shave $2 million off the cost of a breach. Now, this is compared to those companies that did not have those measures in place. And as a typical breach currently includes costs such as people costs, downtime, lost revenue, potential ransom payments, uh, just practicing the IR alone is a valuable investment for your business. So the steps to consider, do you have a cloud-centric incident response program in place at your business? Are your employees aware of what constitutes an incident to begin with? Who and how do they report and manage the instances that are in the cloud? Are you aware of existing cloud tools and resources that are required during an incident, such as extending your logging, maintaining data for forensics use, access to the CSP resources and microservice constraints? Has your program been updated and tested to support today's current cyber threats and response needs? And does your executive team know their role and what is expected of them for an incident? Before we talk about IR for the cloud, it's important to first highlight the standard approach to IR. Prepare, identify, contain, resolve, and review. While there are many common attributes with the standard approach towards IR as it relates to the cloud, there are some key differences and considerations that we're going to walk through here in a moment. Most companies do not plan for an incident, and they enter this life, IR lifestyle at the identify stage. A better way to see this is more of when does incident response actually begin? Not what does your company plan to do to begin this process, but at what point in this cycle will your business become involved? If it's at the identification phase, you're already behind in your response and you're likely to handle an incident, less likely to handle an incident successfully for your business. I like to point out uh, the popular saying by Sir Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. So if after an incident, you were not reviewing with your team what they both did right and wrong, for process improvement, then you're wasting an amazing learning experience with your team. So let's talk about the three domains as it relates to incident response and the cloud. Incidents in the service domain affect a customer's account, their access management permissions, 
the resource metadata, customer billing, most other areas that the business is involved in. A service domain event is one you respond to exclusively with API mechanisms or have root causes associated with your configuration or resource permissions that may even have related service-oriented logging. Incidents in the infrastructure domain include data or network-related activity, such as the traffic to your Amazon or Azure instance within the virtual private cloud, processes and data on your instances, and other areas such as containers or services that your company may use in the future. Your response to infrastructure domain events often involves the retrieval, restoration, or acquisition of incident-related data for digital forensics. And it likely includes interactions with the operating system of a cloud instance, and in some cases may involve the API mechanisms themselves. Incidents in the application domain occur in the application code or in the software deployed to the services or infrastructure. This domain should be included in your cloud's threat detection and response runbooks and might incorporate similar responses to those as in the infrastructure domain. With appropriate and thoughtful application architecture, you can manage this domain with existing cloud tools, use automated forensics recovery and deployment. When it comes to being proactive, there's several things your business can do better to overall enhance your cloud's IR capability. Uh, you can start with your basic design considerations as a, uh, let's talk through some of these as they relate to incidents that occur in the cloud. First up is establish your response objectives. This is working with your principal stakeholders, your legal counsel, organizational leadership to determine the business goals when responding to an incident. Uh, typical goals involve containing and mitigating the issue, recovering affected resources, and even preserving the data for forensics or attribution if that's possible. Responding using the cloud is where you implement your response patterns where the event and data actually occur. You can use tools and technologies already in the cloud to your advantage, such as we previously spoke, the uh, AWS and Azure IR playbooks. Knowing what you have and what you need to preserve logs, Snapchats, snapshots, and other evidence by copying the data to a centralized security-based cloud account using tags, metadata, mechanisms, mechanisms that enforce your company's retention policies. For example, you may choose to use uh, the Linux DD command to make a complete copy of your data for investigative purposes for any incidents. However, you would need this tool pre-installed on Windows and that, having that done already would save you valuable time if there was a forensic acquisition was required. Using redeployment mechanisms, if a security anomaly can be attributed to a misconfiguration, Effective remediation might be simply as removing the variants by redeploying the resources with the proper configurations in place. And when possible, make your response mechanism safe to execute more than once and in unknown states. One thing I wanted to add there, Matthew, as we shift to the next slide is, is the emphasis, the AWS and Azure playbooks are gold. If you're not familiar with them, they've really articulated a lot of the challenges with the roles and the shared responsibilities and just some real definitive information. So use those. And then the second thing that stood out for me there amongst everything else, Matthew, was the emphasis on inventory, the emphasis on knowing what you have and what you need. Um, anybody see the CIS version eight come out last week? Again, you know, they, they whittled it down to, I think, 18 now instead of 20, but continued emphasis on inventory and, and knowing what you have, not just, you know, out there and, and available to you, but service level, third party component level, you know, some real good in inventory uh, opportunities, I think, out there for customers. Sorry, just wanted to in inject that, Matthew. Uh, that's perfect. There's so many people that we've talked to that we ask them about their network and they just, they don't know. Uh, they don't have the proper inventory controls in place. So continuing right along, uh, automating where possible. As you see issues or incidences that repeat, it's more effective to build mechanisms that programmatically triage and respond to common situations automatically. And this saves your more limited human response capabilities for unique, new, or overly sensitive incidents. Choosing scalable solutions, you should strive to match the scalability of your organization's approach to cloud computing and reduce the time to between detection and response as much as humanly possible. You should learn and improve your process always. 
when you identify gaps in your processes and your tools or in the existing knowledge of your team, you should create a plan to fix it. Run through simulations, run through incident response tabletops with a focus towards your cloud and incidences. Improve your, your team's skills and response methods. It's just basic good business practice and helps your team find their gaps and improve your processes before an incident occurs. Just like a well-orchestrated SEAL team. It's almost like muscle memory at a stage, right? You've done this exercise. You've done tabletops. You've done live fires. It's, it is muscle memory. And then again, to talk about the automation too, you know, I want to bring back the, the AIR and just touch upon it. Automated incident response available to you today, I believe. Don't quote me on that. I, I think it depends a little on your service level agreements. Um, but it allows you to leverage things like O365 to do things automatically in an IR capacity. As an example, um, if you got a phishing email and somebody reported that phishing email and you made a determination, you can automatically have a playbook kickoff that pulls that email out of anybody else's inbox that can set some controls up automatically, can identify compromised accounts and phishing and password screen and do these things automatically. So take advantage of that. There's a lot of those features and functions available today for you. Thank you, Sean. I, I like this slide. Uh, depending on if you're a small business to a large business, the basic IR roles and responsibilities can break out, just ex expand, expand uh, greatly. I can't think of the word for that. Uh, but you, handling unclear security events requires a cross-organizational discipline. You need a bias for decisive action and the ability to deliver results when under intense pressure. Within your organizational structure, there should be many people who are responsible, accountable, consulted, or just kept informed during an incident. This includes representatives from human resources, your executive team, your legal counsel. You can, should consider additional roles and responsibilities in case any third parties become involved. And keep in mind that as the data moves across borders, as in many geographies, their local laws govern what can and can't be done against that data itself. And although it might seem bureaucratic to build a responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed RACI chart for an incident, doing so enables a quick and direct communication amongst the team and clearly defines the leadership responsibilities across the different stages of your event. And now we should be ready for a poll question. I think right. developing a RACI as bureaucratic as it sounds for each incident is almost a necessity. Maybe another great actionable piece of recommendation that the attendees and the audience can take today. Maybe start with what I think is the most viable attack vector out there, uh, ransomware. Um, by the way, I can't make it through an, a meeting without saying ransomware right now, unfortunately. But imagine developing an incident response race that identifies who's responsible, accountable, consultant, and informed for those situations. It's a big deal. All right. Does your organization have an IR program that is aligned, keyword aligned, to the challenges of the cloud? Please say yes. Please say yes. Please say yes. I'm interested in this one. <laughs> Let's see what we come back with here. All right. Oh, you know, more than half do have an incident response program. Still many, you know, have to get that alignment towards the cloud and the IR program. And trust me, it's not a walk in the park. I, I'm very transparent resource. As, mentioned, as Matthew highlighted, different geographies, different CSPs, different terms, different legalities, different compliance mandates, they are all going to govern what you do in a different capacity moving forward. So, Great conversation, Matthew. Same to you. Great info. Great recommendations. Love it. Let's move forward with cyber insurance in the cloud. Boy, cyber insurance, been a hot topic as well, right? You know, I think, again, a little bit of a subjective opinion. I think, first of all, reading the fine print from a legal perspective is instrumental, but there's not a ton of protection as far as liability with cloud providers, right? And there's a lot of data that supports this. A single company can have dozens of cloud relationships in their network, and that can make it less clear who is responsible when something fails. And a common request, uh, question we see is in the area of cyber liability insurance and how the cloud impacts cyber risk. This is still evolving, it's unfolding, right? New cybersecurity technologies can help businesses detect, protect, and respond 
to attacks, but they can't really help them recover financially if an attack is successful. There's so much involved there. And I do believe that cyber insurance can provide benefits under certain situations, incidents, circumstances, but it's instrumental to read the fine print. I mean, we're, we're having conversations with customers right now where we're reading their, their policy and we're seeing and there's exclusions set up for acts of war. They're using extortion exclusions. And, you know, I will tell you this much, the, the insurance industry is getting smart quick. All right. And so you've got to keep in mind as you look at these opportunities to help offset some of these costs or the liability, you know what the cloud has, right? Uh, in March of this year, Google announced it had partnered with a couple firms to provide a unique cyber insurance product to its GCP customers, right? Uh, policies will be, I think, initially offered just in the U.S., but it's a big deal. It's going to have, you know, big revenue impact and it'll cover, I think, upwards of $50 million in losses. So again, leverage the information you have and the, and the tools that you have to understand if cybersecurity insurance is right for you, it's coverage to the cloud and how you can get more aligned to that cloud coverage with some of your retainers or policies. All righty, almost done here. This is from CSA, applicable, right? These are three key aspects that set the cloud incident response policy apart from, from the, uh, the traditional IR processes. So number one, we look at governance, right? Data in the cloud, multiple locations, uh, different CSPs. We highlighted this and getting the various organizations together to invest in an incident is a major challenge and can be resource draining. Uh, and it can, does, it has a colossal effect on the client pool itself. The shared responsibility, hopefully we highlighted some of that. You know, cloud customers, CSPs, third-party providers, they all have their different roles to play when ensuring security in the cloud. So you know, customers have to be responsible for their own data. Remember that. Remember the application layer is, again, some subjective opinion here, is very likely going to be that first initial access vector for an attacker. And from there, they do all the bad things that they do. So understanding you are responsible for the data, you are responsible for the app sec, it's important. And then visibility, you know, we talked inventory, but the lack of visibility in the cloud indicates that incidents could have been, you know, possibly resolved quickly into now escalating. Matthew emphasized a lot of the importance of building a proactive plan, getting that alignment in your IR program and policy towards cloud and, and the viable attacks that we see there, you know. Take great care uh, when developing IR processes and documentation. Take full advantage of, of the architectures as opposed to traditional data center models and use those tools and the services and the capabilities provided by your CSPs to enhance that detection and reaction. Because you know what we're seeing is we need to move quick. Right. We know that if it's an incident on our on-prem or in a cloud, that dwell time is reducing our opportunity to understand that something is happening before it turns into an incident is more important now than it ever has been. So increase your visibility controls on the cloud side of things. First of all, thanks again for everybody for, for listening to the presentation. 